of you joining uh, or have joined, uh, we're just in pause right now, waiting for others to join in from the waiting room. Uh, and we will begin shortly. Great, I think we'll go ahead and get started. It's past the hour, uh, just past the hour, uh, and we have quite a day ahead of us. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're located, and welcome to Global Health Day at Johns Hopkins University. I'm Tom Quinn, director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Global Health, and it's my honor and privilege to open up today's activities as we celebrate the commitment and dedication of the faculty and the students of this university and our partners in both local and international communities around the world in addressing the challenges and celebrating the achievements of our work uh, in the field of global health. Every year, the Center for Global Health at Johns Hopkins organizes in collaboration with various schools around the university, a special day in which we highlight the work of the faculty and students by having them present their projects that are aimed at improving the health and well being of people around the world. This year, we have collaborated with the Department of International Health and the Center for Bioengineering Innovation and Design to illustrate some of the really amazing work of our students and faculty. I personally want to thank Alan Labrique, Yusuf Yazdi, Baki Hansadi for their input into the day. And most importantly, Megan Harrison and Anna Kabarzik for their organizational skills in putting together all the presentations and the guidance and providing the guidance to all our students. There are a lot of other people to acknowledge and uh, we will do that throughout the day. But for now, I'd like to review the agenda of the day. I hope you'll be able to stay with us uh, for all of the day as we progress through different aspects and different presentations uh, that go throughout uh, today. Now, our agenda is on the website, uh, which is hopkinsglobalhealth.org, uh, uh, and you can uh, review it there, or, or you may already have access to it as an attachment to the invite to uh, register for the meeting. Uh, coming up at 9.30, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, the Chief Scientist and former Deputy Director General for Programs of the World Health Organization, who will deliver an opening keynote presentation entitled Lessons from the Pandemic for Science and Public Health. Dean McKenzie will provide a formal introduction uh, in about 10, 15 minutes or so uh, when we are joined by Dr. Swaminathan. At 10.30, after, at the conclusion of her talk, and I hope there will be time for Q&A, um, but at 10.30, we'll have three concurrent breakout sessions featuring oral presentations by selected students, focusing on their work over this past year. Breakout room one will address research on HIV and health systems. Breakout two will address maternal child and adolescent health. And breakout three will showcase the work by the students of the Center for Bioengineering Innovation and Design. Megan will shortly describe how that will all work. From 12 to one, we're then gonna go into the student global health poster session. Uh, I just learned how to do this. It's really unique technology where you will be able to virtually walk around a poster room, stop by any poster 
hear the students' presentation, ask questions, and so forth. It's very interactive. There's lots of posters up. I think you'll, you'll enjoy the way this has been developed in a virtual format. I wish we could do it all in person, uh, but uh, we know the situation with that. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Then at 1.15, uh, Alan Labrique, who's professor and associate chair for research in the Department of International Host, will host the uh, afternoon session. Uh, he has arranged some fantastic speakers, which are listed in the agenda, and he'll formally induce them. The focus of the first session of the afternoon will be on decolonization of global health. The Lancet, JAMA, other uh, major health journals have really focused on this. This was a big uh, area of focus uh, at the annual meeting of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health, and we're going to spend time on it today. Uh, Alan has uh, really put together a good uh, agenda for that. Then in the second half of the afternoon, we'll focus on lessons learned and the paths forward uh, in global health. Then at 4 p.m., uh, we have another keynote, uh, the closing keynote presentation, which is by Dame Sally Davies, Master of Trinity College and the convener of the Trinity Challenge. And uh, Alam will uh, uh, introduce her formally. Please come uh, hear these presentations, uh, but also at uh, about 4.45 at the conclusion of Dame Sally Davies' presentation, we're then gonna have an award ceremony where faculty are recognized for their mentorship uh, and are given uh, mentor awards. And uh, we'll also be giving out student poster awards. So uh, a lot of things to do for today. Um, glad we're able to do it all virtually and you're able to, to join us. Let me just pause for a minute. Uh, Megan, uh, any specific housekeeping uh, rules uh, or issues that we should address at this point? This, I'm going to turn it over to Megan Harrison at this point. Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon to those joining from the afternoon. Um, so again, thanks so much for joining. Uh, we hope that uh, you uh, find this, uh, this session and, and this entire symposium easy to navigate. Um, the website here that we have, you've all been sent the agenda website. This will really be your home base. Um, so keep this kind of pulled up on, on your tabs during the day. Um, all of the main session um, presentations will take place on this same webinar link. So you'll be able to return to this uh, for the afternoon session. Um, at 1030, when we go to the breakout rooms, all you have to do is just click right here um, and then join this Zoom link right over here. From there, you will be in a Zoom meeting and there will be three different breakout groups as Dr. Quinn described, and you'll just be able to click whichever one that you are interested in joining at whatever time. You'll be able to jump around in those, for example, if you wanted to join HIV and health systems for the 1030 presentation, but were interested in checking out maternal child and adolescent health for the 1050 session, you'll be able to do that um, pretty easily in, in that. Uh, in that Zoom breakout room format. Um, so that'll take care of the student oral presentations. And then as Tom was mentioning, um, for the student poster sessions, we're going to be using a platform called Gather. Um, and all you'll have to do is just click right here on this link and it will prompt you to enter the Gather, uh, the gather space. And they will give you a short little tutorial um, on how to create your own little avatar. It takes about mm -hmm. 20 seconds. Um, and then it'll just show you kind of how to move around the room. Um, here is a snapshot, a little screenshot of what the room will look like. And you'll have a little person, um, like a little Pac-Man, but a little person. And you'll be able to move around the room using your arrow keys. Um, and then when you approach one of these uh, posters, as you get close, um, a little 
uh, preview will pop up and you'll just, it'll prompt you to click the X, uh, tap the X key on your keyboard and then it will enlarge the poster so you'll be able to read it. At that time, when you come into that vicinity, you'll also be able to see and hear um, the student who is uh, who has created that poster, uh, just like as if you were to walk up to somebody in an in-person uh, poster session, you'll be able to you know say hello and ask any questions uh, about the poster, about their experience. Um, you will also be able to interact with other attendees. Um, you'll kind of see, you know, a bunch of little people walking around. And when you get close to a person, you'll have the opportunity to ring them, um, is what they call it. And you'll be able to talk to them if you, if you so choose. Um, so, yeah, this is a really exciting um, uh, way to, uh, you know, to do some virtual poster sessions. Um, and so we really hope that you enjoy it. Uh, if you have any questions, um, you can um, just feel free to, to send a message um, or um, an email to me um, and our email address. Um, if I just go back to the main agenda page is just right down here. So any questions, feel free. We'll be monitoring that inbox. Um, and then uh, after that, hopefully you'll be able to take a quick lunch break and then join us back for, um, sorry, for our uh, afternoon session, joining this same Zoom link. Um, so hopefully that's uh, pretty straightforward. And again, thank you everybody for, for being here. And I'll turn it back over to Tom. Great, thanks, Megan. Uh, so everyone can use that chat box. Um, there's a link, I think Alain Labrie put it in there that has the agenda. You can just click on that and you'll see the whole day's activities. Uh, if you have questions for me or Megan or others, uh, you know, regarding operations of the day, you could use the chat. Uh, when we're in presentations, uh, like we will uh, shortly, uh, use the Q&A. The Q&A uh, little box at the bottom of your screen uh, is what we'll be monitoring uh, for questions that we will pose uh, to uh, the plenary speaker or to the um, individual uh, other speakers uh, throughout the day. So uh, the chat's useful for uh, us to, to monitor in terms of who's attending. Uh, and uh, if you want to send your greetings, uh, use the chat box for that. Q&A, much more important for the speakers uh, so that we move forward with that. Um, I want to just say a few words um, uh, before we get into the, uh, the real swing of it and are joined by our uh, keynote speaker. Uh, this past year, 2020, and the first half of 2021, has truly been probably one of the most unusual uh, years of my life uh, and of many others' life. For over a year, now on to 18 months, we've witnessed a pandemic of unprecedented, uh, unprecedented impact around the world. Latest reported numbers of infections globally are 154 million individuals infected with SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. And 3.2 million people have died from COVID-19. Those are the reported numbers. The estimated numbers are far, far more than that. Uh, and uh, many cases are just not even detected uh, or the reporting system uh, is uh, not uh, up to speed. So clearly this particular pandemic has had uh, an unbelievable, uh, terrific, and we see it happening in India and Brazil and Russia and other places right now, uh, uh, terrible morbidity and mortality as a result. On the positive side, and you have to always, I'm an optimist at heart, on the positive side, during this year, public health rose to the challenge and public health mitigation measures were put into place in nearly all countries 
that did limit transmission. Uh, and science brought forth not one, but multiple vaccines, incredible technology that we now see, see the fruit of that labor, definitely slowing the spread of the virus uh, in some countries. But in other areas where the vaccine's not available or mitigation hasn't been 100% effective, uh, hasn't really been embraced by politics and other issues, we're seeing a raging pandemic still go on. Really uh, unbelievable forces uh, at play here. So when I look back at this, take a step back and, and also bring in that we're trying to uh, focus on, on Global Health Day. This is really the best example of a global health challenge that required not one response, but a true multidisciplinary response that brought together multiple fields of expertise, leading to significant achievements in affecting change. That is what global health is about. Uh, and uh, it has a ways to go, um, but we are seeing some of the benefits of us all working together across our fields, putting the best minds together and the best science and seeing what we can do to limit further morbidity and mortality. So we still continue, the, uh, continue to promote the essential public health inter interventions to address this really terrible disease. And fortunately, we have with us today uh, the Dean of the Bloomberg School of Public Health, Dean Ellen McKenzie, who's been at the forefront of the response both locally and internationally. The faculty have responded in multiple ways, working under her leadership through educational activities, research, leadership, and uh, Dean McKenzie has orchestrated and led many of these initiatives. And so it, it really, Ellen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dean Ellen McKenzie, who's the 11th Dean of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor, has appointments in the Department of Health Policy and Management, which she used to lead, uh, and in the School of Medicine, uh, in Emergency Medicine. Importantly, She's a member of the Center for Global Health. That's very important uh, since we're hosting today. Uh, and other centers, the Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research and the Johns Hopkins Center for Injury Research and, and Policy. Ellen's a very busy person and I really want to thank her for joining us and uh, introducing our uh, keynote speaker for the day. Thanks, Ellen. Over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tom. A very generous introduction indeed. Um, but good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm delighted to be with you here uh, today for um, Global Health uh, Day and its opening session. Um, it looks like a fantastic day, and um, uh, I'm just thrilled to be here. And if there's any silver lining to this pandemic, it is definitely our Zoom format for meetings that have enabled more people from around the world. And I'm, I'm seeing the, the uh, chat um, just light up with um, um, greetings from people from around the, uh, the country and around the world. Um, and that's, that's fantastic. And it's more important than ever um, for people to gather on important days like this, especially when the topic is global health. So welcome again from, um, to everyone from wherever you are. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our distinguished keynote speakers and thank them for taking the time out of their very busy schedules to join us to contemplate global health resilience business as unusual. <clears throat> I'd like to begin um, by acknowledging the land uh, that the School of Public Health inhabits. Land recognition helps us recall the sacrifices that indigenous peoples have made and their continued significance as part of our community. Land recognition is just one way in which we can appreciate the contributions and counter the erasure of indigenous peoples in our society. 
We humbly acknowledge that Johns Hopkins University is located on the traditional and contemporary homelands of indigenous people. Our campus resides on unceded lands of the Piscataway and the Susquehannock peoples. We recognize the enduring presence of more than 7,000 indigenous peoples in Baltimore City alone, including Piscataway, Lumbee, and Eastern Band of Cherokee community members. As we gather from places around this country and around the world, we honor and recognize the indigenous people of our homelands. Together, we acknowledge the history of genocide and ongoing systemic inequities while respecting treaties made on this territory as a step towards reconciliation and strengthening partnerships and relationships with indigenous people and their communities. We give thanks to the past, present, and future stewards of this land and respect all tribal nations' sovereignty and right to self-determination. We aim to hold ourselves and the university community accountable to tribal nations. Well, as Tom just um, very uh, eloquently laid out, this year has been like none other, a year full of so much change in such a short period of time. And as the world tracks and responds to the novel coronavirus, the Bloomberg School is committed to studying the virus and working with our partners both here and around the world to respond to its devastating effects. The pandemic has served to remind us that our health as humans is inexorably interconnected with our global environment and the animals with whom we share that environment. While we are seeing some success in fighting the virus here in the United States and in other countries, our hearts are very, very much with the people of India today who are fighting an unprecedented second wave of COVID-19. The Johns Hopkins India Institute COVID-19 Task Force that is co-chaired by Drs. Amita Gupta and David Peters was quickly stood up with our partners in India to raise awareness, respond to current needs, and coordinate activities, services, and opportunities to address the pandemic in India. As of today, the Institute's COVID Emergency Re uh, Relief Fund has funded PPE and other medical equipment for partner hospitals, scaled up point of care antigen and RT-PCR testing, and COVID relief camps and non-medical needs like food and hygiene pro products. In the pipeline are projects around vaccine acceptance and sourcing oxygen concentrators and related materials for our partner hospitals. Now you can support these and other important life-saving efforts by contributing directly to the fund uh, following or following the Johns Hopkins India Institute on Twitter and encouraging others to learn more about the pandemic in India and to donate. So please consider taking one or, or more of these steps. And I did ask Megan to post um, the link uh, in the chat um, if you do uh, uh, wish to donate. Well, as Thomas said, the power of public health has certainly been on full display this year, and so has its fragility. Our world has been turned upside down, not only by the pandemic, but also by a long overdue reckoning with inequity, racism, and injustice. The pandemic put a spotlight brighter than ever before on the disproportionate vulnerability of communities of color and those who are marginalized due to longstanding structural inequities and racism. We know everyone should have an opportunity to live a healthier life, no matter where they live, who they are, and how much money they have. And so as we have battled the pandemic, we also continue to battle the public health crisis of racism and health inequity and must hold ourselves accountable for forward movement to ensure inclusive excellence and anti-racism policies. Now it is, it is heartening to see, and again, Tom mentioned, we're seeing a growing understanding and an appreciation for the value of public health. Every day you hear people talking about the public health approach. They are seeing firsthand how protecting one's individual health depends so much on protecting the health of the people around them and those in their community. And what has largely flattened the curve of the pandemic is our collective action to practice physical distancing, good hand hygiene, and disinfection combined with strategic testing, contact tracing, and isolation and quarantine. But I will say that uh, 21st century public health problems like the pandemic, the refugee crisis, climate change, opioid overdoses, um, and many more require us to think about public health in new and different ways. We must embrace new partnerships 
that cross sectors of society outside the traditional public health circles to address all factors that promote health and well being. And that means working with experts in economic development, education, transportation, law enforcement, food, environment, housing, and many others. And to do this, we'll need enlightened public health leaders for today and tomorrow. And I am particularly proud that the school has not wavered from its commitment in training these leaders, albeit virtually for um, uh, most of this uh, year. In just a couple of weeks, we will be graduating nearly 1,000 master's and doctoral students, all trained and ready to make an impact and help us achieve our collective goal of a healthier and more just world. And it is the students who make this day particularly meaningful for me. The Center for Global Health, while coordinating global health activities from around the university, also provides financial support for many students to engage in these activities. And my office is very proud to contribute to these efforts. Now, because uh, travel to other areas of the world have been restricted to, to the pandemic, the students and faculty have been very creative in funding, uh, finding opportunities to further the global health agenda. And this will be obvious in their oral presentations and the poster sessions um, that you'll, you'll have a chance to see. This creativity is certainly a testament to their commitment and to their resilience. Like Tom, I'm optimistic for what I believe the future will bring. I hope we can take the lessons from the past year and use them to restore trust in science and in the power of public health, tackle the social drivers of health inequity, including very importantly, structural racism, and build the will needed to invest in a modern public health system that will protect the health of people across the planet. We must learn from our lived experience and make the bold decision once and for all to invest in prevention and preparedness needed to secure the population's health every day, as well as to serve us in times of crisis. We must use this opportunity to redirect how we think and what we do to secure a better future for our children and their children. We cannot let this crisis go to waste. And now I have the tremendous honor of introducing our Global Health Day keynote speaker, Dr. Samya Swaminathan. Among her many, many accomplishments, Dr. Swaminathan is known worldwide for her groundbreaking work on tuberculosis treatment and prevention, and is a globally recognized researcher on HIV. In March of 2019, she was appointed WHO's first chief scientist. In this role, her vision is to ensure that the World Health Organization is at the cutting edge of science and is able to translate new knowledge into meaningful impact on population health worldwide. Prior to her current position, Dr. Swaminathan was Secretary of the Department of Health Research at the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare for the Government of India, as well as Director General of the Indian Council of Medical Research. There, she focused on bringing science and evidence into health policy making, building research capacity in Indian schools, and forging South South partnerships in health sciences. From 2009 to 2011, she also served as coordinator of the UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, WHO Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases in, in, in Geneva. After completing her MBBS, at the Armed Forces Medical College in Pune and her MD in Pediatrics at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. Her additional training included a fellowship in neonatology and pediatric pulmonology at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, University of Southern California, as well as a research fellowship in the Department of Pediatric Respiratory Diseases at the University of Leicester in the UK. She is an elected foreign fellow of the US National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of all three science academies in India. In addition to all of that, she has um, uh, authored over 350 peer reviewed publications uh, in many of the, the best uh, well known journals, scientific journals. We are so delighted and honored to have you, Dr. Samya Swaminathan and to help us uh, kick off uh, Global Health Day. So please join me in giving her a very, very warm welcome. Thank you very much, Dean McKenzie. And uh, thank you, Tom. 
and all the dear faculty at uh, Johns Hopkins University, many of whom are my good friends and I've worked with and collaborated for many years. So I really couldn't say no to this, uh, to this invitation, particularly since, uh, you know, it's important, I think, for global health students at this time and faculty and all of us to share what's going on um, in the pandemic and its response uh, and talk about both the good things and the not so good things that have happened. And um, uh, so it's, it's really nice to see this uh, event that's been organized today. And thank you also for the concern that you expressed about the situation in India. It's been very heartbreaking to see what's happening there as we've witnessed the same situation in other countries. Uh, and this just seems to go in cycles uh, for the last several, uh, well, 17 months now that we've been in this pandemic. Um, and uh, it's really, really difficult, particularly for countries that have limited resources and limited resilience within the health system to be able to take on this additional load. And, uh, and what's really worrying is while we're focusing on COVID just now uh, and the immediate fallout, of course, of the deaths, the cases, you know, the, the, uh, the longer term uh, effects of COVID, what is not so obvious is the ripple effect on all the other health conditions and the impact on essential health services, as well as the larger ripple on the impact on livelihoods and poverty and undernutrition and what that's going to do. And this, I'm afraid, is uh, going to be felt for many, many years from now. So <clears throat> I'm going to try and share my screen. I have some slides that I'd like to take you through. Um, I hope you can see it. And, uh, and I hope you're seeing the slides and hearing me okay. So I think uh, we heard from Dr. Quinn and Dean McKinsey about the uh, epidemiology, you know, 17 months into this pandemic, things do not seem to be getting better. You can see from this graph that in many parts uh, of the world, you see the different uh, regions, WHO regions have different colors here. The purple is the Southeast Asia region, which has exploded over the last couple of weeks. But you also see the region of the Americas, mainly Latin America, as well as many parts of Europe, where cases are still increasing. Uh, while the Eastern Mediterranean region, there are a few countries in that region which are having bad uh, outbreaks. The Africa in blue, you can barely see uh, because it's really uh, remarkable that the number of cases and deaths reported in Africa have been less than 5% of the global total. This is partly due to the underreporting and the underdiagnosis, um, but partly due to other factors that I'm sure you'll be talking about uh, later today. And on the other side of the slide, you see the countries with the greatest number of new cases in the previous 24 hours. Again, apart from India, US is still up there, Brazil, Iran, Colombia, Turkey, Argentina, Russia, and uh, so many regions of the world affected. This sort of just visually shows you the cases reported over the last seven days. This is corrected for the population. So it's per 100,000. And again, it's Europe, now it's South Asia, it's, it's parts of the Eastern Mediterranean and Latin America. And this shows a percentage change in deaths over the last week and the darker the color, the greater and the more rapid the increase in deaths. Now in some of the countries, deaths go from two to four and that looks like it's a 50% increase. Uh, and that's probably the case in China, which has hardly any any cases to speak about and also in some of the smaller islands. So you need to you know, drill down into this data. Um, but again, this shows you the shifting nature of this pandemic and the fact that you know, as one region seems to be getting better, things are getting worse somewhere else. And we'll talk about the variants later. I wanted to mention the impact on pandemic, on development, on livelihoods, on lives, as well as impact on women and um, children uh, in particular. We've all seen these very stark um, estimates of the increase in global poverty, the increase in malnutrition, and particularly in the um, hotspots, you know, the, the, the countries that are already humanitarian hotspots like Syria and Yemen uh, and, and a few countries in Africa where things are very grim indeed. 
global poverty on the rise for the first time since the 1998 financial crisis. And coming from India, I know that majority of people in India are in the informal workforce. They don't have any access to any kind of social protection program. This is true of uh, large parts of the world. And they are the ones who are the most impacted. So one of the things, of course, that's uh, Dean um, McKinsey uh, mentioned was even within the US, the disparities in terms of race and ethnicity, uh, again, driven by you know, a combination of poverty, you know, less access to healthcare, more risk factors for severe disease, et cetera. So it's within countries and between countries that the inequities have become very clear. This again shows um, the fact that the Human Development Index is going to go down. And this of course means that we are not going to be on track to achieve the sustainable development goals. In terms of health systems, there's been huge stress. Um, we've seen right from the beginning when there was a lack of supplies and equipment, lack of even things like masks and gloves, uh, supply chains were disrupted, a huge burden on healthcare workers. Um, luckily now, because of access to PPE and vaccines in many countries, we're not seeing the kind of mortality we saw in the early part of the pandemic and disruption on essential health services. Now we've done two pulse surveys. We did one in the middle of last year, July, August, and then repeated it um, in uh, January uh, of this year. And what we saw was that while many countries are still reporting disruption of essential services, the um, percentage came down from about, you know, 75 countries are reporting disruption to about a little over 50%. But again, the low income countries are the ones that are most impacted because of course they have limited workforce, they have, um, and therefore limited resilience. You can see that um, many services which we would consider, you know, essential, uh, including um, emergency services, blood transfusions, uh, diagnosis and management of TB and malaria, uh, emergency obstetric surgeries, um, radiology and lab services, immunization programs, and a lot of the NCD services, particularly cancer, were all disrupted. And um, to, uh, to uh, a smaller or a larger degree. And again, there was a gradient uh, in terms of the income level of the countries and to how much disruption there was. So you can see that even now, um, life-saving emergency critical care interventions disrupted in about 20% of countries. So we don't really have good data on excess mortality from many countries, you know, which from the developing world. A couple of countries have done a good job uh, including South Africa and Mexico and really estimating excess mortality and, and reporting that. But uh, there are huge gaps in data, uh, under reporting and under diagnosis basically of cases as well as of deaths. I want to mention the impact on, on women because there have been many studies and reports uh, reporting an increase in domestic violence. And the fact that 76% of healthcare and social care workers are women and they've had to face an increased workload, both in terms of uh, their professional work, but also childcare, children out of school, um, and um, therefore managing um, their house, their children, as well as their professional work. And the balance between unpaid care and the work-life balance was quite significantly different between men and, and women. And of course, the reports on domestic violence in many countries, including you can see data from some of the European countries here, very worrying, as well as the increase, potential increase in trafficking of women and girls who are driven into poverty and who, who have now had to leave school. We've had schools closed in many countries for well over a year now. So the WHO actually put out, uh, you know, quite early in May of 2020, an advocacy brief that spoke to countries about what was needed for you know having a gender lens on some of the policies and the data that was being collected and it was very clear that there was limited availability of sex and age disaggregated data less than half the country that report data to us on COVID-19 have it disaggregated so it's really hard really to make conclusions from that kind of data um, access to sexual and reproductive health services was reduced 
during the pandemic. Um, and therefore, this again uh, exacerbated inequities and there was increased stigma and discrimination. So our request uh, at that time to our member states was firstly to collect data disaggregated by age and sex, include responses to violence against women as an essential service. We you know, ask all countries to have a package of essential services and make sure that that's funded and that uh, carries on you know, throughout the pandemic, uh, including the SRH, the Sexual and Reproductive Health Services, that frontline workers have access to training, to PPE, to psychosocial support and social protection, removing financial barriers for COVID testing and treatment, and the, that uh, emergency responses should be inclusive and non-discriminatory. But we've seen time and time again that there are many, many instances in countries where this has been a problem. So it's clearly, uh, you know, highlighted the pandemic has brought out very clearly, and I think Tom mentioned this right at the beginning, the importance of investing in public health and uh, primary health care. And countries, even low income countries, that had actually focused more on primary health care than on tertiary care actually did much better. And it's good examples of countries like Vietnam and Cambodia, which till very recently were able to contain their infection and deaths to very low levels. Now they're having increased cases because of um, potentially because of the variants. Um, Thailand is another good example. And when I visited Thailand, I've been particularly impressed with the, um, you know, the focus really uh, of the health system really being on good primary health care. The role of science and scientists and public health experts has been clear. Again, some countries where the political leadership um, was strong and they, they relied on their scientific advisors and followed um, the science have done much better than those who did not. The importance of global collaboration and solidarity, particularly um, the science division at the WHO working closely with emergencies program. We've been uh, very uh, impressed to see the level of global collaboration between scientists, between academics, between even the uh, private sector in terms of sharing knowledge and data openly, you know, without waiting, as is the usual case, you know, for publications and things like that. We've seen preprints. So the R&D blueprint, I'll talk about that a little later, but also the ECC, which is the evidence collaborative that came together very quickly. It's about 90 organizations that came together and started working on evidence synthesis and reviews, which can feed into the guidelines, quick development of uh, our, our products, the importance of surveillance and particularly genomic sequencing has also become extremely clear. And I think it's, a, it's a, a good time to really think about extending that to many other infectious diseases that are you know, big global public health problems like TB, like uh, malaria. I spoke about the political will and leadership. Very important is trust. I think, again, that's been very critical to the response in countries, how much trust have communities had in their leadership? How involved and empowered and engaged have they been? Um, and then the societal inequities. I think it's become clear in country after country that the people at the lowest rungs of socioeconomic, um, if you look at the quintiles of socioeconomic status, then there's a huge difference between people who are able to adapt to online ways of working, in fact, incomes rose in the top 10% uh, of people globally and in many countries, whereas the bottom 50% um, or so had incomes reduced significantly. And then finally, the infodemic, which has been this proliferation of uh, information available through all of the social media and other channels. A lot of it is, again, misinformation and uh, leading to uh, distrust. Um, and then there's, there's been you know, uh, concerted conspiracy theories and other campaigns which have impacted uh, public health programs in many countries, including the vaccination uh, rollout. The R&D blueprint uh, is a good model and I just wanted to mention it because it was set up in 2016 after the West Africa Ebola outbreak in order to plan and prepare for research activities before and during uh, epidemics. Uh, and I've lost a slide, but essentially 
um, what was done was to come together and say, okay, we were not prepared for research during the Ebola outbreak. There was complete chaos at that time with many organizations and partners doing their own small studies, all adding up really to no significant knowledge gains. Uh, despite the fact that there were vaccines against Ebola, which were sitting on the shelf in, um, in labs. And so the idea was to develop a research roadmap to develop um, plans, develop target product profiles, develop protocols, prepare in the countries for uh, to undertake research, uh, including clinical trials with drugs, with vaccines, as soon as there is an outbreak, which means preparing ethics uh, committees, regulatory environment, clinical research sites, um, baseline data. So you cannot start um, research studies at the drop of a hat in the middle of an outbreak or pandemic unless there's been preparedness and unless you have the systems in place. And I think the networks that the NIH supports, uh, global networks like the ACTG, et cetera, have been uh, critical because they could quickly shift to, um, so, but there are not enough of those networks and there are large parts of the world which are not really um, um, equipped even though there's interest in those countries. So I think that's, clearly something we need to do much better looking ahead. Now, what did we do, for example, on therapeutics? Very early on, we convened expert groups. This was way back in January of 2020. We activated this mechanism, the R&D blueprint. Experts groups came together. They did, did um, started working on how to standardize animal models, how to standardize assays, you know, to, to be used in vaccine trials, for example, developed code protocols for vaccine and therapeutics clinical trials develop target product profiles for, uh, you know, treatment for inpatients, treatment for outpatients, et cetera, and, uh, and also set up a committee to prioritize therapeutics that could go into um, the clinical trials. Now, our clinical trials registry, the ICTRP, shows us that there are a huge number of trials that are, uh, that are ongoing. You can see 2,900 of them uh, registered um, and you can sort of see the distribution globally. But if you look at um, the quality of those trials or the you know, outcomes, it's very variable. And there are only a handful of trials, probably the large platform trials that have been done that have been able to answer the questions and gather enough uh, endpoints to be useful uh, for, for, for guidelines. So again, you know, having thousands of trials going on around the world is not as important as having good, well-conducted, large trials that can answer the questions. And that's why we actually set up the solidarity trial to look at repurposed drugs. Now this is a little old uh, data, but it shows you um, the sites, over 500 hospitals in over 30 countries that have currently enrolled over 15,000 patients. The second phase is, is going to start uh, very soon. And there are many more countries that are wanting to participate. And what we could show from the initial uh, interim analysis of the first 11,000 patients was that there was little impact on mortality or on progression um, to more severe disease or on the duration of hospitalization among patients who were hospitalized. So with uh, moderate to severe COVID, we looked at remdesivir, we looked at hydroxychloroquine, we looked at lopinavir, ritonavir, and at interferon beta-1. And you can see from these Kaplan-Meier uh, curves that, you know, none of these, unfortunately, we did not find any of the initial drugs that we tested. So I think, again, the learnings are that, well, repurposed drugs, you can move very quickly to do trials. We really need to be more thoughtful and there needs to be better public-private collaboration, looking at libraries that large companies have and looking at potential antivirals. And I think now there's an agreement globally that we have not invested enough in particularly broad spectrum antivirals that, um, and now there are companies like Merck and Pfizer that have some potential uh, molecules that, that you know, still need to go through phase three trials. And there have also been um, the UK recovery trial was a good example, even though it was in one country, it enrolled very quickly because they have their network of hospitals in the NHS. They had a protocol, they had a centrally coordinated mechanism to prioritize which drugs, and they were able to show in June last year that dexamethasone reduced mortality. So that I think has been the biggest success of all of the therapeutics 
trials. And unlike vaccines, we haven't had as, uh, as good luck with therapeutics. Now, I want to say a word about guidelines because that's what WHO does. It does normative and standard setting work. And of course, we use the grade uh, process. There's evidence generation, obviously, preferably from RCTs, looking at patient important outcomes, at geographies, and as, as I mentioned, the platform trials like discovery, recovery, solidarity, remap, cap. These are some of the large platform trials that have been very useful. We then do something called a living network meta-analysis. So a network meta-analysis is something which is a little more advanced than regular meta-analyses, where if you have multiple drugs that are being tested on the same group of patients, you can actually see the interaction with each other as well as the impact of each one individually. Then you know the, the grade process is used, the values and preferences, uh, as well as, of course, the grading the certainty of evidence, and then looking at the impact in subgroups. And then for dissemination, now we're moving into a more digital mode of disseminating um, these guidelines so that we could trigger the uh, changes in recommendations. So you could have done a set of recommendations a month ago, and then a large trial comes out, which gives you new evidence on one of those drugs. So you could then go in and just change uh, that single recommendation without having to go through the whole uh, thing again. We have this handbook on guideline development, which is constantly updated. Up, uh, and the idea really is that you need to move very fast during an emergency, but without compromising standards. So it's a delicate balance. And we um, also need to take into account uh, as WHO, what are the important public health outcomes? Um, and so the cost and benefit of interventions is obvious, is also important when we recommend uh, something. So a drug that makes sense in the US because it reduces hospitalization by two days, which is cost saving, probably doesn't make sense in India or Nigeria because that is not the main uh, uh, outcome that we want to look at. We want to look at reduction in severity or reduction in mortality. So we've had a number of guidelines come out over the last year. And as I said, we now have this living guidelines uh, approach uh, and we, we publish the evidence behind the guidelines at the same time when the guideline comes out so that everybody can see the evidence base. We've classified a disease as non-severe, severe and critical and um, defined those. And then, as I said, we've looked at uh, a number of drugs of which corticosteroids is really the only one where there's been a a strong recommendation in favor of use, but only in the in the severe and uh, critical group of uh, patients. We've also looked at drugs to prevent COVID-19, again, an area where there's been huge confusion and controversy, and we recommended against the use of hydroxychloroquine. We're currently looking at a number of other therapeutics, ivermectin. I, I believe that we have already come out with a recommendation against its use, except in clinical trials. We're currently looking at IL-6 blockers, this should come out very soon. Uh, again, it seems to be of use in critical patients when used along with corticosteroids, anticoagulants, monoclonal antibodies, and uh, colchicine, among others. So hopefully we'll also have data on some of the inhaled drugs that are now being tested as well as on antivirals. We've also come out with um, a lot of guidance on oxygen and we see every day now the importance of oxygen, you know, really the most essential drug uh, and the problems that you have when you do not have adequate oxygen supplies, uh, literally costing thousands of lives at this point of time. But again, these guidances were put out last year for countries to prepare for the need for oxygen, which we knew would increase. Uh, and, you know, this is something um, there's a huge daily demand for oxygen across the lower middle income countries. And it's estimated about 500,000 people need oxygen at any point of time. And this just doesn't exist, this capacity. And unfortunately, um, lives are being lost every year, you know, due to pneumonia and other diseases which need oxygen, but it's become very stark and obvious now because of COVID. We also started a clinical data platform where we invite people to submit their data on their patients, anonymized, of course. We currently have, I think, a little over 100,000 uh, patients in this database, and we're looking at 
how we can strengthen this further um, and use it, you know, uh, to really analyze and, and come up with some good um, and useful recommendations and, and learnings. Just a word about children. We know that they have a lower risk than adults to progress to severe disease. Um, the evidence on specific uh, prevention and treatment, therefore, is very limited in children. Uh, I know there's some safety data on remdesivir, but there haven't been really a lot of, uh, uh, hardly any trials. Um, and the guideline development group does look at children whenever they make recommendations. We also know that a small minority progressed to something called multi-inflammatory syndrome that um, is uh, now getting better characterized. Luckily, it's very rare. Um, and we're also following the reports of longer term symptoms after acute COVID-19 in children. Moving on to vaccines, um, obviously this is of great interest. Um, and the first thing to say, of course, is that, you know, we've seen how accelerated the development has been. And the reason this occurred was the fact that companies were able to do overlapping phases of trials with, you know, the full approval and involvement of the regulators. And also that the manufacturing investments, which are normally made at the end, were made very early on so that even by the time phase three trials interim results were out, there were already tens of millions of doses available. So this was the difference. Uh, of course, with emergency use listing, you then need to put in place the pharmacovigilance programs and commitment from manufacturers to supply data uh, during the follow-up on both efficacy and safety. We have a landscape where we track vaccine development and you can see the large number of vaccine candidates in development about 22 now currently in phase three, 96 in clinical evaluation. These are all large phase three trials. Most of these are now two, two dose vaccines, except for JNJ, uh, mostly intramuscular, though we do have nasal vaccines and oral vaccines, which are earlier in development. The uh, emergency use listing currently has been approved for four vaccines, and there are four more currently in, uh, in process. You can see uh, Sinopharm and Sinovac from China and Moderna, which should all happen fairly soon. I mean, the, the recommendations would, would come out soon. And the, um, the idea of an emergency use listing by WHO is that there are many countries who do not have the capacity to do their own regulatory assessments. And it takes, of course, a lot of time and a lot of resources. So many, many countries depend on WHO's pre-qualification program. And the emergency use listing is, is part of that. So it starts with emergency use and of course, ultimately it needs to be uh, pre-qualified once there's adequate data on safety and efficacy. The other thing we do with vaccines, of course, is the SAGE, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, which have been producing guidelines starting with, um, in, in um, November of last year, there was a document they put out on how to prioritize populations for getting vaccines in the context of limited supplies. And that's been very useful for countries um, to prioritize and to develop their own national vaccine deployment plans. And then following, as the vaccines have come through with regulatory approvals, the SAGE has been providing guidance on how to use them. So this is the policy and the emergency use listing is the regulatory. Now, in terms of, um, you know, the science, it's gone well. Uh, we've seen how uh, we have uh, all of these vaccines now, 14 of them, I think, that are being used around the world. Um, but what about equity and access? And we knew from the beginning that this would be a problem and so uh, would be a challenge. And so we set up this mechanism called the ACT Accelerator with all of these partners that you see around. They're all the big global health agencies. The idea was really to drive collaboration to to both promote our R&D to accelerate the development of these tools, but also to ensure fair and equitable access and to try and reduce the impact of COVID as quickly as possible in all parts of the world. And then we had some ambitious goals on uh, how many vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostic, diagnostics we would deliver. So there are three pillars to the ACT Accelerator and then there's a, uh, there's a health system strengthening pillar which is of course very important because you can't deliver these tools unless you have a strong 
uh, health system. Now the COVAX is the vaccine spiller and the main partners there are Gavi, WHO, uh, CEPI and UNICEF. Um, currently we have um, um, deals with manufacturers to supply uh, just a little over 2 billion doses of vaccines by the end of 21. But um, I will show you some data now on where we are today with vaccine distribution around the world. So we have over a billion doses administered and you can see where in the world these have been administered. There are still 14 countries which have not started any vaccination campaigns. Um, the most common vaccines in use now globally are AstraZeneca, both from uh, AZ and from Serum Institute of India, which is the Covishield, followed by Pfizer and Moderna, then the Chinese and the, uh, the Russian vaccines, and now slowly the J&J &J and others are, are coming up. But if you look at um, the number of doses administered, you can clearly see that the gap between the highest income and the low income countries is widening. It's not, it's not reducing. And um, 86 times more doses um, in, in high income countries compared to the lowest. COVAX has been able to mobilize resources uh, and we've rolled out vaccines. About 50 million doses have been distributed to about 100 and uh, 20 odd countries um, using seven different uh, vaccine candidates that have signed agreements. At the moment, we're relying mainly on the AstraZeneca vaccine and a little bit of Pfizer. Uh, so the issue is not that there hasn't been commitments in terms of resources. It's been more around the supplies and particularly with the situation in India now, the supplies have uh, sort of uh, almost dried up. And um, that's why we're now putting out a call for increasing the production, increasing the supplies through COVAX so that there can be a good uh, global fair distribution. So we not only need to share intellectual property and we really welcome uh, uh, the announcement from President Biden's administration uh, about supporting the TRIPS waiver, but that's not going to be enough. Uh, companies are, are going to have to share the know-how, share the, uh, technology, share the data, share the processes, train people and strengthen local capacity. Um, look at, we need to look at regulatory and technical issues and sustainable financing. So all of this is going to be important in order to increase manufacturing and supply, which eventually after COVID is over, will should be able to then pivot to manufacturing other vaccines. Currently Africa, the African continent manufactures less than 1% of vaccines that they use, not COVID overall, and they import 99% of vaccines. So they want to change that and they have a very ambitious uh, goal that in the next 15 or 20 years, they should be manufacturing 60% of the vaccines they need on the continent. And so we have a new uh, task force now set up uh, to to work with African Union and other regions to, to help them to do that. Um, so at the moment, we're, we're asking countries to explore every option for increasing production, including voluntary licenses and technology pools. Of course, we need to strengthen regulatory capacity, invest in local vaccine manufacturing. Um, and also we're asking for donations of doses from countries that have excess uh, uh, supplies. So I would like to uh, finally say a few words about um, variants. Um, the platform GISAID has been extremely valuable and currently has over a million whole genome sequences from around the world. This is a platform that was set up for influenza about 10 or 11 years ago and quickly was able to set up a platform to receive SARS-CoV-2 sequences. And clearly it's been critical for us to track viral evolution to identify these variants. Currently, we have three global variants of concern, the B117, the B1351, and the, and the P1. Um, we expect this to happen, of course. We expect mutations, but not every mutation or variant is of concern. So we need to be able to identify and evaluate the impact of a particular variant on public health and social measures, on vaccination programs. Uh, and, and we need an integrated framework that can help us make decisions. So we're now setting up this mechanism 
which will co continuously look at um, the data that you know comes in through different sources um, and then do a risk assessment for each of the variants. We currently have seven uh, variants of interest that we are looking at. Um, and as I said, three variants of concern. There's uh, the research data that will feed in, there's epidemiological data that will come in. And then of course, there will be uh, recommendations made on, um, on what needs to change. Are diagnostics still working or do they need to be modified? Vaccines, uh, as well as public health measures. So far, luckily, the public health measures remain the same um, because the variants still spread in the same way. It's just that they, some of them are more transmissible. Um, so we're building on existing systems like the Global Influenza uh, Surveillance and Response System that's been in operation for something like 60 years now with 150 labs and um, learning some of the lessons from the annual influenza strain selection, which is a very global and a very well coordinated program that's been running for many years. The R&D blueprint, as I mentioned, there's a lot of coordinated research efforts going on there. The laboratory networks, you know, dealing with other diseases uh, as well as other partners. So finally, I think we, uh, uh, before I close, I would like to say that we know so much more now than we knew at uh, this time last year. We were struggling uh, at that time. Uh, but despite you know knowing so much more, we are still not able to really uh, control the situation in many, many countries uh, around the world. We haven't applied either the knowledge or the products that we've developed comprehensively or, or evenly. And so I think we need to really focus on protecting the vulnerable and saving lives. Um, the epidemiological situation is dynamic and uneven, uh, but there are bright spots uh, across the world. We see many countries continuing to suppress transmission. Some of these are island states and therefore it's easier for them to close borders like Australia and New Zealand. Um, but there are countries like China and, and South Korea. And as I said, till recently, um, uh, we had Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Singapore. So many countries in Southeast Asia, perhaps with their experience of the SARS, um, did strengthen their surveillance and public health response capacities. And we will have during the World Health Assembly in two weeks from now, recommendations from the different review committees, including the big pandemic preparedness review committee, uh, an independent uh, committee will make recommendations, not only on what WHO needs to do, but what countries uh, very importantly need to do in terms of having more transparency, more accountability um, and stronger international health regulations. So we really, I think a lot of health workers were put at risk. And I think all of us know health workers who've either been very ill or who have died. Uh, many friends of mine have, have passed away, uh, unfortunately. And um, surveillance systems, again, in many parts of the world, the data is so patchy, not even cases and deaths, forget about sequencing data. Communities, I think we've, we've forgotten about communities in many cases, and um, we, we, they need to be part of the response. We spoke about the infodemic and how it's only by empowering communities and by having trusted spokespersons and local community leaders, you know, that you can, you can build trust and change people's behavior. And then of course, as I think I made the point that while science is delivered on solutions, um, equity, global equity is under threat. Thank you very much. And I'd like to turn it back over to Dean McKenzie and uh, Tom. Dr. Swaminathan, that was fantastic. Uh, what a comprehensive uh, review of the pandemic, the accomplishments, and yet the challenges ahead. I, you know, as you were closing, I, I want to express my deepest condolences and sympathies to you and your family for loss of uh, individuals during this terrible pandemic. Uh, and that goes for other people who have lost loved ones um, it's, the, the numbers are just, I, you cannot believe them every morning you wake up and you hear the numbers. Uh, NPR 
uh, just uh, highlighted India once again the, this morning, uh, like over 400,000 cases in a 24 hour period, unbelievable number of fatalities, lack of oxygen, lack of medication, the healthcare system totally under stress and, and really being pushed. Um, so I know how busy you are. And I have to thank you for taking this time. I, I really personally appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, and joining us. Uh, you probably don't remember, but I met you at the Women's Global Health uh, Leadership Forum in London uh, a couple of years ago with Heidi Larson uh, and, and group. And I knew you were a fantastic speaker then, and I, I know you are, uh, and you've proved it uh, once again. While you've been speaking, there have been many questions coming in. Uh, I've tried to monitor some of these. I've also asked uh, Dr. Baki Hansadi to join us, since I know you know Baki. Uh, Baki, are you, uh, can you unmute? Yep, I'm here. There she is. Um, I, I'll, I'll just lead off with one of the questions, and uh, Baki and I can do a tag team. Uh, hitting you with some of the questions coming in from, uh, we've had several uh, hundred attendees uh, in, in listening to your talk, and many of them are from India. My first question to you is a little bit more on the personal note. When this epidemic began, and we started seeing the numbers rise in the developed uh, world, uh, if you will, seeing it go up in Europe, seeing it go up in the US. Um, I, I was wondering what was gonna happen in Africa and certainly uh, the Asian uh, countries, uh, which are so populous. And in fact, the numbers, you know, in the first year, uh, the numbers were relatively low uh, in Southeast Asia, including India and, and Africa, except for the Republic of South Africa. That then changed. I, uh, what happened? Why, why did this massively take off in India? And how can we try to mitigate uh, that explosion of cases? I, it's not an easy question, I know that, but Love to hear your personal perspective. Well, I think, um, Tom, last year, many countries uh, were uh, completely shocked by what they saw happening. As you, as you said, we saw it happening in China and then it very quickly came to Europe and we saw Italy followed by UK and other countries where we th everyone thinks they have very good health systems and they do but even they were completely overwhelmed. And therefore, you know, there was fear of the unknown and there was strict action taken in many countries. Many countries around the world went into lockdown, as you remember, complete lockdown for yeah. several months. And of course that had its own unintended consequences, again, on the poor, but uh, it did slow down transmission significantly in those countries mm. uh, and it gave them time to, upscale diagnostics. Most countries did not have diagnostic capabilities in the early months and, uh, and also undertake training. And by the summer, we had some information on transmission. We knew the modes of transmission. We knew cl some clinical features and management and already some early trials uh, telling us about drugs like dexamethasone, etc. So the management was improving. Case fatality rates were coming down. Those trends were seen in all countries. Well, I also think that countries in Africa in particular, but also in Asia, have invested in community health workers, particularly due to the TB and uh, programs. And, and they were able to use the polio yeah. workers, TB workers, you know, they were the ones who have relationships with communities. And of course the TB program suffered, but all of those workers then were able to turn to COVID. And, and people were listening and people's behavior also, they were following the advice of governments. And then of course now it's been such a long time that everybody's tired. So there's fatigue. Yeah, the fatigue. Following the same yeah. advice, there is uh, uh, the resumption of economic activity. Many countries just had to get back to economic activity and they relaxed the public health measures. And then the variants have not helped. Some of these variants are much more transmissible. And so given the amount of social mixing, they've been able to 
produce these exponential uh, growth curves. And those are some of the reasons. Dr. Hey, Sonny, yeah. I'm going to start with a hard one, to be honest, and this is from one of our Hopkins DRPH students. Um, thank you for a tour de force of a presentation. But, you know, one, this question talks about, you know, the pandemic has highlighted global collaboration and the need for solidarity. Yet we've seen numerous examples um, of the me first nationalism and xenophobia um, with challenges with equitable vaccine distribution, equitable distribution of resources. So could you speak or advocate right now with our group of 199 listeners what can we do as a global community um, to promote global so solidarity? What are the definitive actions that we can take as institutions and individuals to promote equitable distribution of vaccines and resources? So I think, you know, highlighting the data and the gaps is, is very important. Many ordinary people may not know what the real situation is. There was an interesting survey done in the UK, which asked people whether they would be willing to, to wait a while and if their doses were shared with people in other countries, you know, young people. Um, and now, in fact, we're seeing that in some countries, um, adolescents and children will be vaccinated. And in other countries, even the frontline and health workers haven't got their vaccine yet. So I think we need to make uh, people aware of these facts. Um, health literacy in many countries is extremely low. Um, so I think there's a gap between, you know, it's not true that all high income countries have highly health literate populations. Um, and then, so there are economic case to be made for uh, global solidarity and equity. The world cannot get back to uh, normal functioning unless all people in all countries are protected. So no one is safe till everyone is safe. There are scientific arguments on the variants that can come back. And despite you know, having a highly vaccinated population, you might eventually have a variant that is resistant. And then it would start all over again. And then of course, there are the ethical arguments that all human lives have equal value. So there, there are a number of reasons why global solidarity and and equitable sharing of uh, the health products that have been developed, particularly since they've been developed with uh, a lot of uh, public funds, you know, taxpayer funds, philanthropic funds. Uh, and so profits, you know, should not come over, over people's lives. And there needs to be, I think, a citizen's movement really. And I think there is, there is a huge pressure now on governments and, and that seems to be having um, an effect. I have a, a question that's coming in from Amita Gupta, who's uh, our, uh, one of the co-leaders of the Hopkins India Institute, which has been uh, recently developed and is raising funds and support and manpower uh, to help with the India uh, pandemic. Her, her question to you is, what's the biggest short-term need for COVAX and how is vaccine allocation to be done in settings of surges, such as those occurring in Brazil and India? I mean, you could probably interpret that question one or one in two ways. Should, should the shift in allocation uh, be uh, done based on, on uh, the situation of the surge in a particular country? Um, or should it be equitably distributed as you were talking about uh, early? Not an easy question. Amita's yeah, it's uh, not, tough. not an easy question. It's a, <laughs> it's a good question. And it was something that was obviously debated a lot by various groups when they were developing the fair and equitable distribution. You know, we have an allocation framework. And ultimately, the consensus was, and all member states, by the way, were involved in these discussions uh, because WHO is a member state organization. So we, don't, we cannot make these decisions without involving everyone. Yeah. And it was decided that when you have limited supplies, then you need to have first an equal distribution in the sense that every country should get enough doses to vaccinate their priority populations. So we estimated 3% of a country's population may be healthcare workers and frontline workers. 
and then you go to 20%, which includes the elderly and the vulnerable. Obviously, due to the, you know, the demographic profiles, it, it varies in different countries. But if you had 20% of your population's needs, you could probably cover the most vulnerable. The idea also was, uh, thinking was at that time that because the outbreaks have been shifting, if you went by epidemiology, you would rush your vaccines into one country or one region and then by the time you started the vaccination program, there would be another part of the world that was getting badly affected. So the idea was in the first phase, go with uh, equality. So cover 3% first with available doses, then go to 20% and beyond 20%, then get much more flexible and, and bring local epidemiology into the formula. And there's actually a formula and an algorithm so every month when we get, okay, we have 50 million doses to allocate 100 million doses, the uh, algorithm is run uh, for all the 190 countries that are part of COVAX. Of course, 92 of them are AMC countries, which get free vaccine. The rest are purchasing vaccines, so they have more flexibility on timing and which vaccines they want. But uh, so that was the thinking behind the allocation mechanism. And the first question is, what does COVAX need now urgently? It needs doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine because there are people who've got their first dose and have not got their second dose because the, the doses from uh, SII are not coming through and we don't expect we would get any for the next couple of months. So all countries who have AstraZeneca doses that they can spare, we need urgently 20 million doses to come to COVAX so we can cover the gap at least in the months of May and June. Thank you for that. And I think I'm going to continue with this vaccine theme because I think this is at the forefront of many of our minds. So uh, another question, um, this is from David Peters, Chair of the Department of International Health and also um, co-chair of the Johns Hopkins India Institute COVID um, Task Force. And he's asking, he's saying, you know, thank you for the tremendous talk. The COVAX facility is one of the greatest innovations in global cooperation that this epidemic has seen. But there is still a lack of COVID vaccines. What additional approaches do we need in addition outside of the COVAX framework to share vaccine production and products across countries? Um, in line with that is what can be done or what, what is the likelihood of achieving vaccine patent waivers um, to ensure a scale-up of vaccine production. Okay, I think I covered some of this in my talk already. So I'll try to answer it briefly because I do need to leave in a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, there are multiple actions that can be taken. Donation of doses, um, diverting supplies. Uh, High-income countries have blocked a lot of doses, especially with Pfizer and Moderna and J&J. &J those countries could say they can wait a little bit and divert those doses to COVAX. There could be fill and finish. Uh, you know, the, the United States made um, two large pharmaceutical companies come together, which would normally be rivals, but these companies came together, J&J uh, &J and Merck to, to collaborate on making vaccines. More of that can be done. Bring the developing country manufacturers in and uh, ask, there are a number of manufacturers who are wanting and willing to uh, take technology and start manufacturing vaccines. So there, there's a whole variety of things uh, that are, uh, can be done. Uh, of course, it's not easy or straightforward always. Uh, there are some short and quick wins. And then there are things which will take a little bit longer, as I said, but will ultimately build you know, more regional health security and uh, just build that capacity for the future as well. So that's why we need to take both the short term and the more medium to longer term approaches. I'm gonna ask one more. I know you need to leave soon. Uh, and, and I uh, appreciate again, your time. This is, a, uh, this is an easy question for you. <laughs> with India being the country with the highest tuberculosis incidence, also very high HIV, are there systemic parallels with COVID management in the country? Are we going to see a resurgence of tuberculosis with these cases? How are both, uh, how is the impact of COVID on the health infrastructure going to impact tuberculosis and, and HIV for the years to come? 
I told you it was an easy question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, I mean, TB is one of the diseases that we're really worried about. Yeah. But I think um, there may be short term, um, you know, setbacks, but I think in the longer term, we can actually learn, um, you know, in terms of molecular diagnostics, we've been able to scale molecular diagnostics so much that that capacity can be used for TB diagnosis. We have point of care diagnostics. Some of that, those platforms could be um, tested for, to see if it works for TB. We uh, should use the same momentum that we've generated on vaccines to develop better TB vaccines, particularly using mRNA platform. And then all the digital tools that have been developed, uh, the apps that have been used, you know, to track symptoms, to track patients, to track people who've received vaccines can all be applied to uh, both detection of K TB cases, as well as tracking people and following them up, making sure that they're taking their medicines, et cetera. I think that's one area which we should use in the future, not only for TB, but also to manage non-communicable diseases in the community, for example, um, because we've just you know, got so good now at doing things digitally, including telehealth and telemedicine and teleradiography and all of that. So I do think that there are a number of things that we have learned and we've advanced in terms of technology that can now be applied. Of course, you need the funding and the willpower and, and the community of scientists to advocate for that and take it forward. But um, certainly the WHO is very much uh, engaged in these discussions globally. And I think there is, uh, there is interest in, in pursuing some of these uh, ideas. Yeah, thank you. Mikey, last question. I'm gonna let Dr. Swaminathan go and say thank you so much for um, joining us today, for um, giving us your wisdom and for giving this like a summary of this one year pandemic we've all been in with the in the tunnel in sight, the end of that tunnel. Um, I wanna to apologize to all of those who did post some very great questions in the chat. Um, please stick around for the remainder of Global Health Day. There's going to be continued dialogue throughout the day um, with a focus in the afternoon on decolonizing global health um, and working together as a more cohesive community, um, both here and afar. And Dr. Saminathan, um, if you have any parting words, I'll hand over to you. But thank you wholeheartedly for joining us um, here today and for being an inspiration to so many of us and for your dedication to this cause. Thank you, Bhakti. Thank you, Tom, and thank you all for this opportunity. It was, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And uh, our best wishes to you and the leadership of the World Health Organization in leading the way uh, to combat this disease. It's so important at this time. But thank you for taking the time today too. We know how busy you are. And everyone commented in the chat and the Q&A what a great presentation. So it's hard to do virtual applause, but it, it, I'm unmuted, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. All right. For those staying on, please don't hang up. Uh, we're going to be moving into the student presentations. I'm going to hand it over quickly to Megan to guide us. Thanks Megan? so much, Tom. Thanks so much, Tom. Hi, everybody. Thanks for... Uh, listening to that wonderful presentation by Dr. Swaminathan. And please go ahead and join us. I'm gonna post the link here to the student oral presentations. That'll go ahead and give you the Zoom link to, uh, to select which breakout rooms you'd like to uh, participate in. So thanks so much everyone and we'll see, you, we'll see you soon back on the other side of that. And remember you can go from breakout room to breakout room depending on uh, what you would like to hear. Uh, the students have prepared for this, so I hope you'll all join us. All right. We'll see you over there. <laughs> Bye. Bye.